Go ahead, Chaya. Okay. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jaya Luintel. I am now with you from Kashmandu, Nepal, which is in South Asia. I'm the founder of the Story Kitchen in Nepal, which creates a space for women, marginalized, minority, and excluded groups, and work with them to amplify their stories and voices. And I am a Cody graduate. Before we start this session, I would like to remember and acknowledge all the women and human rights defenders who are risking their lives and working at the front line for peace building in their own context. I am thrilled to moderate this conversation with amazing five women leaders from Central Asia, Latin America, Central Africa, East Africa, Central America, uh, and, and I'm from South Asia because, and, and there are so many attendees uh, today to participate in this session. This plenary session is part of the global virtual conference, Local Women's Voices for Peace, being organized by Cody International Institute in partnership with women working as peace leaders on the ground. The title of this session is Addressing Cultural Norms. Cultural norms and practices can hinder and at times halt women's peace and security work. In response, Women incorporate local capacities and knowledge for peace to challenge cultural barriers and create new understandings and practices. This session today highlights the examples of women's actions to shift cultural barriers and support peace. We'll be listening from five speakers today, the amazing women leaders who are work working in their own context and addressing the cultural norms to establish peace in their own context. Today we'll be uh, listening and uh, conversing with Nodira Azizova from Uzbekistan, Gladys Farfan from Bolivia, Lillian Divo Young from Cameroon, Zen Meriwas from Kenya, and Gloria Manzotti from uh, Panama. So we'll be having conversation with five amazing uh, women leaders. And first, um, I also, you know, discussed with uh, all of our speakers during our prep meeting, like just before we started this session. I'll be starting uh, today. I'll, I'll go in the alphabetical order, but when we say alphabetical order, it is from A to Z. Orphan alphabetical is the A aseta. Starting from Uzbekistan uh, today. And uh, we have, um, we have uh, Nodira Azizova. Uh, and let me introduce Nodira Azizova. Uh, she is doing amazing work in her own uh, context in uh, Uzbekistan. And she has uh, extensive experience of uh, working in her uh, context. From her early childhood until the present, Nodira has been leading to support the people and particularly vulnerable groups to believe in their potential and try to reach new horizons in their lives. While fighting with the discriminations she faced in her own life, and she found the strength to fight against the multi-layered injustice. Nodira has received numerous educational degrees, but she believes that the education and desire to learn more continues. During the last 17 years, she has been working as a researcher of socioeconomic and gender issues in Uzbekistan. She continues her research to find new methodological and practical approaches to mitigate social risks in rural communities. Nodira. The floor is all yours. I'd like to request you to share your experience from your own context. Uh, yeah, you are, yes. Okay. Hello, the organizers. I'm so delighted to see you and to join, uh, to participate at this conference. And it reminds me my time when I studied in coding in 2015 in the Global Leadership Program uh, with, with amazing uh, facilitators. And I always remember all of them. And my heart is partially in this small, sweet Antigonish city, always with you. And it was an uh, amazing study. It was an amazing program with uh, 
many uh, international leaders from the world. And I continue my study then in the US uh, and uh, indicated from the Syracuse University, a sociology program. And uh, then again, came back to my country and working at the grassroots level as, as the social and gender consultant. So today I would like to share my stories uh, from the grassroots level. And I would like to ask you to uh, uh, show this presentation, please. I sent it to you by email. The pictures and the presentation. Is it possible or? Uh, yes, uh, we need to make you. Uh, Apologies, I, uh, I, I. Do you have it on your screen, Nadira? Yeah. I just sent it to the facility, the interpreters. I apologize. Okay. You can share your screen. Uh, Eileen, I think we need to make co-host. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. And thank you for your warm uh, words and presenting me. I'm from Uzbekistan. Uh, that is an amazing country, but it's a double land wrong country. We have no sea, we have no ocean. And actually it was my first time when I saw the ocean. It was in Canada when I was uh, 45 years old. So now, um, however, we have very good climate and very good um, conditions for developing of agriculture sector in Uzbekistan. And a lot of people um, are depending from agriculture. The agriculture is the most huge, big labor market for all people in Uzbekistan. And of course, uh, the sharing um, about their stories, it's behalf of rural women of Uzbekistan. It's a uh, big a pleasure and it's a big honor for me too. So I would like to share the two stories of Muhabats, rural woman from Tashkent and Fergana region of Uzbekistan. And then I would like to uh, do small excursions to the enabling environment of Uzbekistan since 2016, and then share the uh, challenges of uh, agriculture. Los retos de la agricultura que enfrentamos en Uzbekistan para las mujeres rurales, ¿no? Y luego compartir o mostrarles eh, con base en estos ejemplos cómo las mujeres rurales utilizan formas de resolución de conflicto pacífico en sus comunidades en Uzbekistán. Ahí está, para hacerlo más grande. Gracias. Muhabbat. Yo sé que algunos de ustedes conocen esta palabra. Quizás sea también una palabra internacional, pero significa amor. Entonces, dos héroes de mis historias es, es, se llama Mohabat y ella es dirigente comunitario en la región de Tashkent. Tiene dos hijas y es dirigente en una casa muy normal. Aquí lo ven. ¿Y qué hace ella? Es desde la mañana, ella hornea pan para su familia. Usa, hace todos sus trabajos, además de ser líder de su comunidad, también es ama de casa y hace todo en la casa. Quizás ustedes puedan ver alguna vez en su vida, en esta foto a la derecha, es el pan más delicioso de Uzbekistán. Es un símbolo de la paz. Este es un símbolo en Uzbekistán. Así que, sin embargo, durante el COVID y antes, las mujeres rurales en Uzbekistán enfrentan muchos problemas en la agricultura. Y la pandemia también afectó de manera negativa a porque perdieron a sus trabajos en el sector formal y tratar de, trataron de cambiar sus estrategias de sobreviviento. Y esta dirigente, Muhabat acá, tenía ciertos terrenos en la comunidad y las dedicó para las mujeres desempleadas 
y pobres, ¿no? Entonces ellas comenzaron a cultivar la tierra y a crecer zucchini, que es una calabaza, ¿no? Eh, y es, tiene, hay mucho mercado para eso en Uzbekistán. Y tengo una pregunta. Había un problema de cómo iban a compartir su producción con el mercado internacional. Durante la cuarentena, el transporte era cerrado y también los caminos locales, pero nuestro gobierno anunció que la producción agrícola es una prioridad muy alta. Y entonces le dieron permiso local para le dieron permiso para llegar a los mercados locales y locales y internacionales. Entonces habían conductores en sus comunidades y emplearon a algunos jóvenes, mujeres y hombres para empaquetar estos calabacines y entonces vendieron estos productos a Rusia y otros países. Y de esta manera, esta Mujabat, líder comunitario, ayudó a la comunidad a tener un ingreso y a compartir pues, condiciones de empleo entre las personas marginalizadas de la comunidad. Y pueden ver aquí hay un mercado durante la cuarentena en Tashkent. No hubo escasez de producción agrícola. Todos estos productos son locales en nuestros mercados. Entonces, um, la base de género legislativo y normativo de Uzbekistán es muy bueno. Tenemos, hemos firmado muchos convenios internacionales y tenemos muchísimas resoluciones en los libros. Pero muchos de esos se integraron apenas el año, los últimos años son sobre las garantías. Los últimos dos aquí son garantías de derechos e igualdad de oportunidades entre mujeres y hombres y también proteger a las mujeres de hostigamiento y violencia. Estos son problemas enormes, pero se logró mucho progreso en estos últimos cuatro años. Entonces, como dije, las mujeres rurales enfrentan desafíos con la sección de horticultura en Uzbekistán. Problemas económicos, claro, falta de crédito por no tener bienes. También falta de conocimiento y educación de cómo diseñar sus y organizar sus, sus documentos financieros y poder abrir negocios propios. También se enfrentaron con muchos obstáculos burocráticos en los bancos y en, al poder registrar y diseñar los documentos y falta de tiempo para caminar y hacer las preguntas pues durante el tiempo de calor o durante el tiempo que están muy ocupados en, en los en los campos. ¿no? Y una cosa que yo estudié mucho es son las normas de género y los estereotipos de género. Y muchas pues, tradiciones culturales que afectan de manera negativa a las mujeres rurales. Pero nuestras mujeres rurales no las consideramos pasivas ni sin poder. No son simplemente sujetos de la política. Ellos son muy activas. Ellas son muy activas y ellas tratan de resolver sus problemas de manera pacífica. Por ejemplo, esta Segunda Mujabat, que le digo yo, ella compartió su historia en un seminario y ella solo tiene dos solcas que son pues parcelas pequeñas de tierra en su casa. Y compró un poco como de plástico y se construyó su propio invernadero y pues creó, cultivó tomates. Así que por el, durante el primer año, sus gastos por semillas, fertilizantes, etcétera, eran no más como 80 dólares. Pero con este método, eh, aseguró que tenía una buena ganancia. Y después, cada año ha aumentado sus ganancias de esta tierra. 
y luego ella logró emplear a su hija, a su hijo y a su marido. Y también empezó una buena producción financiera porque cultivó los tomates, después abrió una pequeña tienda en su comunidad donde vende los tomates y ahora está cultivando. Es, bueno, realmente se han convertido en una muy buena empresaria en su región. Y a pesar de las mujeres que no tienen conocimientos profesionales, que se casan muy jóvenes, que alta tasa de natalidad, con falta de tiempo para educarse y relaciones patriarcales y falta de oportunidades para un empleo productivo en el área rurales. A pesar de eso, las mujeres son activas y buscan formas innovadoras y nuevas y pacíficas para su desarrollo económico. Y entonces a mí me pareció esto bien alentador y emocionante porque muchas personas durante COVID perdieron sus ingresos y se bajaron al nivel más pobre de la población. Entonces, esa es la pequeña presentación que les tengo sobre lo que está pasando a nivel de base. Entonces, cómo ellas resolvieron sus problemas culturales y económicos con mucho trabajo. Y cómo ellas lograron superar y mejorar su, su bienestar para sus familias y sus comunidades. El, gracias por su atención y gracias. Me alegra mucho poder participar en esta conferencia. Muchas gracias. No diré, es increíble poder escuchar las historias de las mujeres de su país. Y muchísimas gracias. Y por compartir con nosotros y, y traernos Mahamat y las mujeres con las que trabaja para que compartieran con nosotros su empoderamiento económico y crear este espacio para que estas mujeres pudieran crear este espacio para que las mujeres logren su potencial. Muchísimas gracias, Nadir. Estamos tan felices de tenerla con nosotros. Y es, vamos a hacer preguntas después. Ahora voy a presentar a nuestra siguiente oradora. Voy a pedir Nodira entonces que deje de compartir su pantalla. Muchas gracias. Ahora quisiera presentar a nuestra siguiente oradora, Gloria Mazzotti, Mazzotti de Panamá. Gloria tiene más de 12 años de experiencia trabajando con las Naciones Unidas y de desarrollo en diferentes contextos en América Latina. Gloria ha apoyado muchas estrategias y programas para promover el acceso a la justicia, seguridad ciudadana y prevención de conflicto. Ha contribuido al diseño de nuevo conocimiento y herramientas de acción, así que también apoyo técnico para iniciativas globales de proyectos regionales, nacionales y locales de diferentes agencias de las Naciones Unidas y otras ONGs. En específicamente ha dado consejos y políticas públicas para el diseño de políticas de seguridad ciudadana, apoyo de sistemas de transformación de la justicia en América Latina y promoción de los derechos humanos. Ella ha combinado su experiencia academia, académica con el, su servicio público. Part, participó en la, el manejo de la seguridad de policía del Ministerio de Interior de la República Argentina y diseñó el Instituto de Entrenamiento de Policía y también sobre la habló sobre participó en el Senado y organización en Argentina antes de estar en su puesto. Actual trabajo en Panamá sobre su justicia, seguridad y derechos humanos. Ahora le paso la palabra a Gloria para que comparta con nosotros su contexto y exper experiencia y aprendizaje. Gracias. 
Muchísimas gracias, Jaya, por, y muchísimas gracias también a Robin y todo. Quiero contarles. Everyone, I would like to. I would like to greet you today in this anniversary. And I signed up for this for first as, as a participant because I wanted to hear everyone. And and so I'm thankful for this opportunity to use to speak because this is an opportunity to hear everyone and the collective session. And so very kindly, Robin invited me and it, it, it makes me delighted to have this opportunity to share with you. I have four or five points that I would like to share with you this morning. And, and I'm the regional, I am the regional advisor in justice and human rights. I'm, I am speaking from Argentina right now. And I have the privilege of had the privilege of learning more about the reality, local realities in the countries and throughout the region. But, but this hasn't been always easy because I also have had a chance to reflect upon all the challenges of this work in organizational culture and social cultures. And the first point that I wanted to share with you is, this is 23 years ago, and this, don't worry, it's not going to be too long, but when I began to work as a, a, a research team at the univer National University, we it was a measure of armed forces and society. We were in a process of dem democratization at that time. I was 19 or 20 years old, and so the first form in which I participated in the, I found just an auditorium of 500 persons with five women, and two of those women were academicians. And I remember that in the source of inspiration from a colleague from Brazil and another colleague from Argentina. And so, and they were they, so the commanders and the others, this caught my attention because this public was for had women as a role of accompaniment and a social role but not as a role of sitting down at the table presenting topics that were important for public policy and i mention this because there was a space I have 23 years later I have this privilege for example in latin america have a, a network of women who were researching security and defense this doesn't mean the women had, were had a training in gender uh, focus but at least we are uh, occupying important spaces in a, a security sector which perhaps is one of the most resistant to women's participation of all our states in terms of we, we think of the justice sector and the police bodies in the sectors that traditionally have been so resistant to uh, fem women's participation. They've been very masculine uh, spaces. And so we think we've also been able to replicate practices that were common for leadership styles that, and that were from the patriarchy. It, it says that was the first message that to, we need to occupy these spaces and and from from a practical and, and concrete perspective the second message and and i have a collection of an anecdotes free from role playing uh, and men's planning exercises for public policy that i'd like to share with you but first in terms of praise and uh, appeals in terms of of references to physical aspects and so for latin america the, the stereotypes were that for example i have a nose that was unusual in these traditional sections and 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 so i mention this and i laugh at it because it's, it's about it because it's something you have or in the training but in explaining how things men want to explain to you how things are and they make comments on your physical appearance 
and so and so men feel are very comfortable and feel the right to to be able to offer some space for representation for the, so that what they're saying is the men say you can give the opening remarks, but when it's time to talk about strategic points or in, in technical aspects, then they ask, and where is the consultant, meaning male consultant? Where is the male consultant? They come, they reveal themselves there that they can't imagine that a woman could be the specialist, the consultant. And the second point, when they think of this strategy, we think, what tools? Because I always use strategies that have been given by women's networks, active listening. And at the, when you're taking the floor, then they just come in with lots of content so that when you speak, you, you, a, your message is so strong, they have to sit down and listen. And, and of course, this is the give and take as we go. The third point, is it, use your voices in the common sense. Frequently, we demand so much of ourselves. We, we have common sense with it. So, but we have Gloria? to see the possibility of reading as well. Sorry, so, sorry to interrupt, Gloria, but our interpreter uh, is asking to slow down a little bit. I know you are so much passionate, and I know like how it feels, but I'd also like to request you to slow down. Thank you. I apologize. I, I get so excited that I speed up. And, and now, the, second, the third message is to use our tools and common sense and for our knowledge, as well as our knowledge and the message. And we use our voices, of course, there's a, a tremendous challenge, which is, which is to be able to use, to be able to exercise power. But our, to if we think in inst police institutions in the context of COVID, I'm sure that if we talk among ourselves, um, ourselves, who are more than 50 of us on this conversation today, we'll quickly understand that over and above the difficulties and the political tensions in Latin America, then we, we, we are, we're addressing some paradigms and that are related to our gender of rights. But if we, if the police institutions are just to give an example alone, or we leave them alone, they are aware uh, that something to do. They are aware that they are insti outdated institutions that have been stuck in the past, that their regulatory frameworks are obsolete. They are not inclusive, that, that they have to look at from the perspective of women within the institutions and in terms of the public service that they are supposed to provide to all the citizens and in terms of the rights that they're supposed to protect. And so we know that many of them have a number of different departments and that they, they would be, be much more transparent and a higher quality if the institutional infrastructure were simplified. If we think about the processes for information of, of, for our public officials, then we want to see that, that we see different, uh, so many departments and training in terms of discipline, but discipline with the mentality of being closed and and being able to be, uh, to be able to have it be insular. And so I think with this infrastructure, they're always appealing to the in Latin America the lack of security. The security sector in Latin America has had has had less evolution than the healthcare sector. It's had a greater investment as well. It's had a greater investment than health or education. And the security sector has had more investment than the social protection systems. And I'm saying this because frequently what we suggest is what we can contribute in addition to the information, the technical language and our training and the tools for transformation is is this sense of in from the common sense of how we're able to, to organize and make this function 
these spaces function. So this is the other message to participate in these conversations and see to put on the table the points that are key and obvious to us, but that there are barriers there are walls in terms of the policy. And here in Latin America, from the political, the policy structure, we have the updating and institutional training of the security sector. And would it be, this will be possible as long as we're at the table, if we are forming part of the conversation, otherwise we won't be able to contribute. And the final point that I wanted to discuss with you is the intersectionality, the intercultural aspects and diversity. That we from our spaces are tend to um, facilitate vo the expression of voices. And we inserted, we're not so inserted in who we are that we, we have to use that voices serve as bridges. And but if we want to include Caribbean women, um, Caribbean women in the conversation, it's not I who can speak on behalf of Caribbean women. I can pr help provide a bridge to give voices to those women and the great diversity of women throughout the, um, the regions. And so this would be the, the tools we can offer for the, we can do this with the confidence that we have a, a large, a wide margin of error. And to do this with a feel, the, uh, to be able to enjoy this and to share, just as I'm enjoying sharing with you this morning, and also the issue of diversity. I go back to the example of the in police institutions. How can we think of a quality institutions for the this century when we have such a difficult context of the pandemic, when we find we with their framework and internal regulations that we we'll, will penalize practices using the, their language of what they call homosexualism or lesbianism. In some countries, this is more severe than other. It's more serious to have what they call homosexual practices than to murder someone. And so we have to open up this conversation. We have to see that the possibility to transform, transformation, it, it, this is, is so odd, but it, it, is, it is uncomfortable for many many of my female women said, see, you're so impatient. How did you dare to bring this up? And I said, yes, but it's because we want to see transformation and I want to see different outcomes. It's not an easy task. And as my last point I want to share with you is I've had the privilege of forming part of an organization in which the, mo the majority of the representatives is, I'm a representative in Latin America, we're, for, we're women. So I would like to thank my female colleagues who are, are working in this area in our countries. I invite you to continue in your social networks and uh, from Brazil, in Bolivia, Argentina, the Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Cuba, all of these are, are countries are represented by women in the networks and they are daring to propose transformation of the justice and security sectors. It's not an easy task, but with our organizations, no one should be left behind. And if we do Terminamos por ese sendero, o no vamos a poder cumplir ese, ese lema que además de ser un lema muy bonito para nosotros es una agenda para la acción. Muchísimas gracias y quedo atenta a sus preguntas y es un privilegio y agradecerles a ustedes por su atención y sin duda que otra vez a Robin por su cálida invitación. Thank you so much, uh, Gloria. It is amazing to you know, listen how uh, you have been working Uh, gracias, Gloria. Ha sido impresionante. for uh, women to be researchers, which is always dominated by uh, men. Uh, and in our context as well, in Nepal as well, it is the same. And how you are uh, claiming that masculine space by creating the new cadres of women in the research area. And I really appreciate how you are creating that space to amplify the voices and knowledge of uh, women. And as you have mentioned, how this uh, all the resources are 
put into the security sector versus the uh, social protection uh, we are still you know struggling to keep uh, that balance to bring that uh, balance and i totally agree with you about the intersectionality uh, you you shared about and uh, i really am proud of uh, the work that you have been doing how you are trying to bring all the women around you onto the table so that they can again you know talk about their issue through research and through uh, other you know system change issue thank you very much uh, gloria uh, i am feeling so privileged you know listening to all the amazing women leaders around the world and now we will go to our next uh, amazing speaker uh, gladys farfan uh, and let me introduce uh, gladys first gladys farfan is the mayor of yunchara since 2010 She now serves as the president of the Association of Municipalities of Tarija, Bolivia. Her leadership at the head of a traditionally patriarchal municipality has led her to become the first woman mayor of her place. She is elected twice in her constituency. With her strategic vision, she has helped to generate development, stability, slow down migration. and improve educational and health conditions above all she brings she brings her experience and expertise in gender mainstreaming by strengthening women's participation in decision making processes she has adopted gender equity as part of municipal policies by creating and including the gender office in the municipal organizational structure she created a space for emancipation of young women through technical training with economic ventures in community tourism and high andean life stock in bolivia now i would like to request gladys farfan to share her experience and the amazing work she has been doing in bolivia gladys the floor is yours gladys you need to yeah unmute the mic that is robin can you unmute her mic from there yeah yeah now it is working please um y agradecer por la invitación sobre todo i'd like to thank you for the invitation above all for considering us and including us My name is Gladys Alarcón Farfán. I come from a very small municipality within Tarija in Bolivia. The, it's a rural municipality that has a diverse ecology. We are one of the municipalities that is located in the high area, in the, Al the Altiplano of Tarija. And we also have a beautiful valley where we produce grapes and other fruits. the main richness that we have are our people our views our land and our agriculture and our culture as uh, others have mentioned i come from a municipality where we have rarely had the opportunity women have rarely had the opportunity to participate in the past in our municipality has always been led by men by may mayor men and men leaders and it has been very difficult to gain inclusion of women and for women to make headway in different organizations in a leadership role because of this we have taken on this challenge and i work i have worked since 1997 in my municipality in different different positions i've worked with children and initially it was in young children under 6 in child care and education and i also later worked as the person in charge of youth and um teenagers and then i started work in the municipality and my role as a woman started to become come forward as a candidate for the movement for socialism and when we won the election in 2010 with 64% thanks to that we were able to 
we were brought forth by or popular organizations and according to the laws and regulations in our municipality, I won the election with 87% of the vote on my second re-election. And I have five other council members who were in from my same political group. And thanks to this enormous, overwhelming support by the people, we have begun to in focus, focus on social policies and economic policies that we have been implementing from the very beginning. So what has our been, been our major challenge um, to avoid children leaving school and trying to get women included in education? Because for many women, the, culturally, they have been relegated away from education. So in rural municipalities, usually the idea that people hold is that there's a group of family, and if family, the priority is um, for the boys to go to school. And the girls, well, they can, but they're sort of second choice because the idea is that why should girls go to school if well, they're going to get married and men are the ones who are going to have to take care of production and uh, the financial aspects of the family. So we've been working on changing this since we've been in office and have been working on creating municipal policies to create participation of women and encourage that and gender equity and create, we've created a programs that are called Girls, Teens and Women Finish Your Secondary School. This program has had great results in our municipality because we've provided scholarships through international organizations to create financial resources so that there are scholarships for all these young girls and teenagers who had been relegated so they relegated so they can now participate and finish their high school diploma we're starting to work as a municipality on gender equity and this has been a part of it another challenge important challenge that we've faced is to see how we can help those women who have who are already beyond the age of elementary school and had not had the opportunity to study so we've created an alternative education center for girls who are over age 15 girls and women who can go to that school and not only finish their elementary school but also their middle school and high school and they can study technical degrees like food, um, tourism, and uh, ranching in the high Andean area. And there's other series of technical careers that they can learn so they can graduate with actual tools to be able to work and create and be innovators developing their own projects within the municipality we would not have been able to achieve all of this without really focusing on gender equity, which we had really not had before, in order to focus on these programs. In addition, because of our own characteristics in the municipality, we have also raising um, camelides such as yamas has been very important. It's been an important part of our economic development in the area. Yamas do not require a great deal of care. And because of this, we realize that many women who are in charge of caring for the animals and also who are in connection with nature and caring for our natural resources, this activity can generate some opportunities for them in order to take on education and take on technical training. Another aspect that we have generated in our municipality is eradicating training for women. We work on training of women because training is a can be something very sporadic, you know, just like 
occasional thing, but don't lead to something specific. But when we talk about education of people, especially women, has allowed us to allow for new opportunities such as restaurant for tourists and um, hotels for for tourists. We also have women who are doing creating clothing and um, sewing clothing that are now being sold locally and in the province. And we also have a technical institute which creates also very skilled technicians. And that has really allowed, uh, we've allowed to have equipment for this institution. And so this young people are learning and beginning new projects. Also as a municipality, we have the mission that to stop migration and getting women trained and educated so they don't have to migrate because that goes on on hand in hand in hand with training lead, women leaders. So when women become leaders, a lot of problems get solved in terms of social problems, economic problems, and political problems. And the problems that we have between women is among women is also solved, which is the problem of violence. And we feel that women suffer from violence and that's often because of their economic dependence within families. So this has been a joint effort within a program that we called Bioculture and Climate Change. And what has helped us to strengthen and generate leadership based on grassroots organizations. We have women who are today union leaders, who are municipal leaders, who are president of their school boards, and who are members of municipal councils, municipal representatives. Most of in my municipality are women. And so women have taken on different roles, different situations, different decision-making positions. The president of social control who is supervises the municipal work is a woman. And the women are, we women, I think, Many of us are very good administrators of state goods. We also work very well with others. So because of this, when we, we were, when a delegation visited our municipalities, you can see the great advances that we've made in terms of gender equity. However, we are still one of the poorest um, municipalities in our province and in the country. Today, we're very proud to say that through the studies that have been carried out by UN, UNDP, two weeks ago, the results came out from Tarija, and Inchara is no longer in the poverty level in our department. So this is really encouraging for us because we have worked on inserting women in regular education and technical education, but we've also worked on production, on economics, on food security. We have built um, more than 500 different hothouses to grow vegetables and different food that can supplement the family's diet and also be sold to generate income for families. Another important aspect that we have worked on in the municipality is that when I started my first term, we had 30% coverage of communities with potable water. Today, we have 87% of the communities who have potable water. The other 13% does have water, you know, through different pipes and stuff, but it's not drinking water yet. So we still have to work on this very small percentage that is left. And this has been a part that has also created great gains in health and saved women's time because they used to have to go get water from the a distant well or from the river and having drinking water in their homes 
has increased the quality of life for the women. And it's also saved time and provides them the opportunity to become trained as leaders and become learn a technical career and to help in the education of children, which is fundamental to transform society. We have in our municipality, we came in with the reality that we had very little resources, but we have an incredible wealth in terms of natural resources and human resources. We have such an amazing people and healthy people, and my people have the high, lowest level of rape and femicide and violence and in, uh, domestic violence, but we're still working to get rid of these altogether. We believe that it's important for women to be able to take and use these decision-making roles. In 14 years, a lot of laws have, to come, have been put in place to help women, and it's important with unity of women, we can really support each other and fill these new spaces that are available. One of the important experiences that I've had as a municipal authority is that in Tarija, there are 11 municipalities of the 11 municipalities, 10, sorry, or uh, it was not, we have received support from our help to so we have the presidency of different municipal associations. Undoubtedly, this has generated and created a message that based on the municipalities, we are able to work on equality and gender equity, but not only locally and not only in language. We have to do it, in fact, from the grassroots, based on our people, and based on the organization, and based on education. That is critical. So we have improved. We have generated great conditions in all the different stages. So the women who live here have more opportunities to improve themselves and get ahead and also become leaders who clearly will help change the municipalities in all of our rural communities. This work together with in alliance with our people, with our women, and with our local authorities has made it possible for our municipality today is no longer in the level of poverty within our province. So I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gladys. It is amazing to you know listen from you, the work that you have been doing and the comprehensive, comprehensive approach you have taken as you have become the leader of your municipality, how you are uh, trying to bring like everything together, uh, enhancing the individual capacities to change the cultural norms, uh, to create the access to resources uh, to the women in your community and also, you know, changing the policies, changing that change in your, bringing that change in the system so that once you are not there, when there is another leadership, they can continue uh, this work. I really uh, feel glad to listen to you. And I am also linking this in my own context. In Nepal, in 2017, uh, there was a local election. And it have, it, the election uh, happened after 20 years because we had 10 years long armed conflict. And because of that, local level election could not happen. But in 2017, when we had local election, uh, we are also very proud to say that we have 40% women. Orgullosamente, tuvimos um, una mujer en nuestro nivel local, pero los desafíos, como mencionó, siguen muchas mujeres como vicealcaldesas o alcaldes, o sea que están de, en el papel secundario todavía, sino que son los asistentes y hacen trabajo excelente, así que Hay muchos desafíos y como mencionó, han comenzado a crear sistemas de educación alternativa y cómo han construido poderes, programas de empoderamiento económico y mencionó que están tratando 
de erradicar el, la capacitación porque es una cosa pequeña y quieren realmente que las mujeres eh, se formen si, sistemas para equidad en el, el sistema educativo. Realmente es bien emocionante escuchar todo esto y podemos ver que las mujeres, cuando las mujeres entran a puestos de poder y cuando están en la mesa pueden crear cambios. Y lo más importante que siento después de escucharles cómo están utilizando los recursos que tienen en su propio contexto, que eso es lo más importante. Y Cody también cree en utilizar lo que tenemos en nuestros contextos locales. Entonces, en su contexto. Lilian Dibo Young de Camerún y Zen Mary de Kenia no not able to join us uh, maybe because of the uh, technology because we are relying on this technology um, that's why you know maybe because of the technology Lillian and Zen could not join us uh, but we would like to open this uh, forum open this conversation uh, to have more uh, question answer and to have uh, the conversation so that we can hear more uh, from our all uh, three speakers And I would like to request all our attendees, if you have any questions to uh, our panelists, you can also write in the chat box or uh, there are also a few questions coming in the, uh, the Q&A uh, box as well. Uh, so let me first you know, read uh, the questions. Uh, it is from, and, and pardon me if I, if I cannot, uh, I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, pardon me. Uh, and we have, As a way, Zhang Nogongi, uh, Nogongi so who is asking, uh, this question is, to, uh, is for Gloria. Uh, Gloria, thank you for these insights and congratulations on your achievements with engaging women. Uh, however, what's your appreciation of male reception and support of this women constituency? And what specific shifts in cultural norms are occurring amongst your male counterparts? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sí. Muchas gracias por la pregunta y también por las anotaciones en el chat. Y eh, también eh, qué bueno escuchar la experiencia de Gladys. Un, The experience of Gladys. Un privilegio. Eh, been a privilege. La pregunta es difícil. The question y, is difficult to respond to. Una vez. Le pregunté Once I asked a una referente de nuestra a, región. Another de, person from our region who is a serves as a reference point. En un I, país post conflicto, eh, como, y es una mujer trans eh, que está a cargo de un instituto de investigación, le pregunté cómo hacía qué recursos usaba cuando tenía que hablar frente a las fuerzas de defensa en su país. Y ella dijo, elijo mi vestido más bonito de color rojo. <ríe> Entonces esto lo cuento porque en la búsqueda eh, yo también eh, me hago yes. esta pregunta. I ask myself how, it's because there's a, a important, important point I would like to stress. It's not because I know that we have different focuses, but because we wouldn't have just different institutions and different public services. But yes, in terms of respect and respect and a space to be able to have an impact on the conversation. And the second, that the, the, the effort is not just to transmit transform these perspectives that have been so internalized in the public functionaries in the security sector and our organizations have invested so much in training and in, in progress in normative framework in terms of women's inclusion in however it continues to be a very difficult sector it is for me a key and I, i'm We are aware that one of this is access to spaces and it, this is a, 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 an important space 
but also how we do this conversation, the transformation of the institutions is not just of the public officials who are leading these institutions, of the ministers who are in charge of these institutions, nor is it just that these women who have been able to occupy, been able to occupy decision-making positions in the in the sector, because we have had female heads of police, heads minister, female ministers of defense, ministers um, head of justice, female minister of justice, and, but the, the conversation is is a conversation of each society. Is a conversation. You see, we don't have manuals to refer to, but to open up the space for the conversation and take it beyond the institution, the network of interlocal women who are working right now, providing legal support for victims, providing support for victims or who are working in different areas have a great deal to contribute in terms of security institutions, what types of security institutions we want as a society at large. And so this is one of the keys to be able to take this conversation out from just a group of friends who are exercising power to expand that to a key conversation of what type of society do we want? What type of institutions do we want? In my case, we have a very concrete agenda, which are the sustainable development goals in this, the SDGs, I, I talk about transparent, efficient and quality institutions and number SDG number five talks about all that we need to do to in terms of gender. It's very difficult for this sector to, to not associate with gender with violence against women or gender-based violence. We want institutions with cross-cutting gender focus. We want institutions, both at the community level and the national level, is where the, our, our voices are heard. In, in the, another experience I'd like to share is that it's not the processes of transform, institutional transformation that have come and go, that have the, the required time but as a society, but with, in the justice sector, for example, and and we can flood the justice of women and for their, their groups in Mexico and Brazil and the conversations that are being carried out in Paraguay and Bolivia and Argentina, which that we won't continue just training. We've invested a lot in training at the higher educational levels for the justice sector, but we have had a response that it doesn't reflect the reality of women. Just last week, we were sharing with a public defender in Brazil who was saying that 80% of the demands for legal support in the public defenders office that we receive from regarding the state are from women and the Afro women and youth. 70% of the staff that are in charge of providing the public defender services are men they're not young and they are white. And so there's conversations of art is, is out of society. We can continue training, the aspects of training is important, but we also discuss what type of institutions do we want to have? We have the, the, the concrete question is, it's the, 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 it has to do with the resistance we have to making these institutions more representative of the population. And it was very painful to have to hear that there are certain paradigms that that are look backward looking. That doesn't have a, a rule of law, due process, the institution conversa democratic conversation that would lead us to this transformation. So it's not easy. And obviously, for the traditional men who have occupied these spaces who've made use of their power and privilege in the case of the security sector. Again, the access, uh, it, it isn't easy, but for me, the the key is not to, the, to limit the conversation to them. If they're, why do they want to change? They're very comfortable as they are. And so we're, this is rather with the institutions that we have, so the 
the message is that we have to open up this conversation. It won't be easy. I think we'll find if we come back to talk in a couple of years, we will be able to tell about the obstacles you've and barriers you've encountered, but we will also be able to talk about the progress that they made to be able to uh, facilitate this space of transformation. In my own case, this is something when I began working with a, pol a police institution, the uh, youngest civ I was a civil civilian, so that made me invisible. I wasn't a they didn't consider me able to propose anything and they would they so the question is what is this young civilian woman doing here she comes from academia and and she is and she and she comes from a ministry that wants to have a civilian leadership for our institution it was a very difficult situation and, thank you and the response could be considered yeah. symbolic yeah Thank you very much, uh, Gloria. I, I, you know, totally can uh, understand the situation, how difficult it is uh, to intervene into that patriarchal system where uh, the men and those who are in power are enjoying that uh, power and privilege. Uh, but we keep, you know, fighting. Uh, we keep engaging with them uh, for, uh, for the advancement of gender equality. And there is also another question from Josephine. And Josephine uh, Yalang is uh, from Cameroon. Uh, and I'm also very glad uh, that Lillian uh, is able to join us, but her microphone was not working. That's why she will be joining us uh, again. So Lillian will also be with us today to share her experience. And Josephine uh, is also a Cody graduate uh, from 2018. Uh, and uh, Josephine would like to know and to get more insight on how best to engage men into including women on the peace dialogue table at decision making levels in a highly patriarchal environment where it is like a norm that men should be in charge from government top to community bottom levels. Uh, despite of this challenge, how do we engage men to include more women into this uh, process? Uh, maybe, you know, I would like to ask this question to Gladys. Gladys, would you like to respond to this, how we can engage men so that, you know, they start creating that space for women in, uh, in decision-making uh, levels? Yes, um, to begin with, it's critical to include men in any classes or trainings that we have regarding rights of women. The main mistake in our society, it, in other time periods, was that the women would get together and we'd talk about our problems among women. We'd tell all of our sorrowful, sorrowful stories and concerns, but we would not include men in that discussion. As we empowered women about leadership and about their rights, we would then send them to groups where there were men and women, and there was a conflict that, that women could not share the same and show the leadership that they had, they became intimidated because of men. And obviously, this made it that we weren't able to create spaces within those organizations or within our society. The work of including men within the training about rights and possibilities of women and the roles in su supporting within the family, in supporting the education of children, in production, in housework, et cetera, in production where men and women can work equally, I think that allows men to change their perspective about women. School clearly plays a, a critical role as well. From the very young age, we need to work on gender equity with children. And we should not separate the different roles that 
our children play, depending on their gender. We need to have holistic educational policies so that at the home and at school, we can transform mentalities of men and women and live in a society that is equal. Another important aspect is empowering and raising the self-esteem of women themselves. Often it's said that women are our own worst enemy and that machismo and patriarchy is not only exercised but by men, but also by women. And so, although there is a possibility of participating often, or in some cases, women ourselves set up barriers and limits on, cre on stepping into certain roles because we believe and we've been trained to believe that we don't have the ability to be able to fulfill those roles and that those are men's roles and we can't fit into that space. So the fact that there are women in public positions and in leading organizations and NGOs is a way to break through that and create that role model and get rid of the fear that we have so that women need to realize that if that woman can, then I can as well. And that is the strength of example that we can provide those women who, thanks to God and thanks to support we've received, have the opportunity to be in these spaces and create policies to empower our own women, which is critical. We have to work from the family, from the school and society in general. Thank you very much, uh, Gladys. Thank you very much. Uh, Norira, actually, I have a question for you because you are working with uh, rural women uh, in, your, um, uh, in your community, in your country. Uh, I'm wondering how you work with uh, women because there is so much stigma like when women come out of their home. Uh, so how do you uh, convince women to come out and, and um, join this public space, which is uh, not, you know, traditionally assigned for women. So how do you uh, cope with that challenge? How do you deal? Uh, how do you deal with that cultural norms, which does not allow women to come to a public space? Uh, thank you. That is a fantastic question. Uh, question because we are still among the uh, traditional norms. And as you know, our main religion is Islam and a lot of women can't go out and speak loud in front of men. But we're also a former uh, part of the Soviet Union and we also heritage the Soviet system of uh, encountering and uh, involving women in socioeconomic life of the society and of the country. And now our policy, gender policy also is very strong and um, the president and the whole staff uh, of government, they uh, pay a lot of pre attention to prior and prioritize the gender equality and gender uh, women involvement in social economic life of the society. And um, now there is a green light for women to participate in this, uh, let me say, in patriarchal, society in Uzbekistan. And uh, because of we have this also Soviet traditions from Soviet times, a lot of women politicians are still active at the political arena as well as economic and social life in our country. So uh, we are trying to find the balance between family and the professional development. And uh, we are progressing a lot, but still we have a lot of cultural and traditional barriers, to be honest, yeah. And we are trying to improve, trying to reduce these obstacles for women and particularly for rural women because a lot of gender stereotypes and patriarchal traditions, they mostly, they very often they're uh, very strong at the rural areas. Whereas at the urban areas, uh, women who have the access to education, to infrastructure, to transport, and all this in IT technologies, they are more progressing and they have this uh, privilege to participate more in the society, more actively. So we are trying to uh, progress and to find the balance and try to 
uh, neglect this disparities between uh, urban and rural uh, women also. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Nadira. And we always have to uh, fight hard and struggle to see that green light all the time so that, you know, women okay. can come out of their home and, and start claiming the public spaces. Thank you very much. Uh, and I hope Lillian can uh, join us um, very soon. Uh, and I'd also like to, you know, ask a question uh, to Gladys. Uh, how, what are the challenges you are facing as a woman leader in your own uh, constituency, uh, being a mayor, and again, it is, uh, uh, again, it is a masculine uh, space as you have shared uh, before. So how you are, what are the challenges uh, as a woman leader you are facing and how are you responding uh, to those uh, challenges like this? Bueno, gracias por la pregunta. Eh, el primer desafío... Thank you for the question. The first challenge is to finish my term, my 10 year term that I have and to lead my municipality as we have said with better health conditions. We have built different clinics in the community so people don't have to go great distances because I have a very large municipality so people have access to health care close by so they can get the care they need. Regarding education, we have been able to um, also provide transportation for children who used to have to travel long and walk long distances. We have created, we have provided computers for all children in middle school up and sometimes in elementary school. We have also strengthened the educational system in order to, to create technical graduates in the municipality. Issues in terms of leadership and politi politics. I'm currently, I'm a candidate for the first senatorship in the Department of Tarija to represent my political party, which is the Movement for Socialism, which is led by <coughs> our ex-president Evo Morales. And we are involved in that political activity. On the 18th of October, we will have elections here in Bolivia, and we are sure that the people will make the best decision and ex elect people's candidates who have been serving the people. And we have worked on policies who favor all of these sectors, which have who've been forgotten for so many years, which is basically social sectors, young people, women, elderly, and people with different capacities. And we have been able to create policies in their favor. These are the challenges that we now have. And specifically for me personally, I'm very proud and it gives me great satisfaction to present, represent such a small municipality and have had so many positive results thanks to the work of the people, the conscious, the awareness of my people and the constant and ongoing work that we have put into this to create both within authorities and civil society. And that now I have been municipally, I'm hoping to move forward to a national position to be able to consolidate policies in favor of women and push and continue forward. And I am convinced that unity among women is going to achieve that we are going to be able to achieve very positive results for society. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. Uh, it seems like Lillian won't be able to join because she keeps coming and her mic is not working. Uh, and we are also about to wrap up this uh, session, this amazing uh, session. And I have one uh, last question uh, from my side to, to Gloria. Uh, like we, we all, you know, coming to this context with our own privilege. Uh, I would like to ask you like what privilege uh, do you have, do you, have you recognized uh, in, in you and how are you using that privilege to challenge, to address the cultural norms? Muchas gracias por la 
thank you for the question. And I'll begin by telling you that I came to work in these areas because of my university backing. I, I attended the public university in my country. And so I did with Gladys who talked about the important about access to opportunities, educational opportunities. And this is perhaps what I wanted to stress. The university opened the door for me for everything. It wasn't that, that I came into public uh, governance in my country because I was in a political party. I've never been a part of a political party. I became to because I was part of a research team originally in a time when the countries in southern the Americas look for people from academia to be able to help contribute to the transformation of political public policy in security areas. And so I have to recognize the great value of public education and and if also I had lost my father and my, my mother needed us to help work to help support the family. So from the time 20, I've helped to support my younger twin sisters and we'd be, we'd be able to allow them to study as well. So access to public edu quality public education is has been the step that made it possible to generate opportunities to be able to currently be in these spaces. It's been a great privilege that is related to this is having been in contact from a very early age with networks of women who are doing things, who are discussing things, who are testing things. And this has always been a privilege as well to have these as reference points that we don't have manuals of how to do it, but we do know we want to do it differently. And undoubtedly, the privilege of being able to participate in spaces and regional and national conversations, it's been a privilege for me. And we see that as a bridge, it is the bridge. It's, I don't have the answer, this is not like our, the final destination, it's the bridge. And so the first time it's a woman and a Latin American woman is serve as a regional advisor for rule of law is a, it's so recognizing this has been a privilege in my role. I've served as a bridge, a bridge for generating opportunities for women and to to hear women's voices and to, to push for this and to generate this. I would like to say that, that, that I would like to stress again to underline the importance of public education. I say, were it not for the public education opportunities, I would not be where I am now. Thank you so much, uh, Gloria. Uh, we have uh, Lillian uh, Dibo Iyong from Cameroon here. I can see Lillian. Uh, Lillian, can we try, because we cannot see your microphone turned on or we cannot see the symbol. Can you please speak so that we would know whether your microphone is working or not? And maybe you can just, you know, talk so that we can check. Okay. It seems uh, the connection uh, is, uh, is very weak uh, where Lillian is now. So let's see if she joins, then we can see like, because we are also uh, coming to the end of this session. Nodira, you wanted to answer that question because I saw you turned on your yeah, uh, yeah. microphone. Yes, please. Uh, I just want to say that I totally agree with Gloria. This uh, access to public education and to education, it's a huge, huge privilege for us, for women who is able to help other women without access to education, without uh, um, access to books, from remote areas, for example, in Uzbekistan, uh, to uh, hear their voices. For example, for me, I'm also uh, consider myself as a bridge, like you said, Gloria, or like to transfer their voices 
to the international area, to the national arena, arena also, and to give them opportunity uh, to be alive in this uh, life. It's uh, very difficult for them to uh, struggle to fight with the poverty, with a lot of other socioeconomic issues, because uh, a lot of countries in, else, in Central Asia, they're also transforming from the uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they transforming from one economy to another kind of economy, to the market economy. And that is a very difficult period in all countries for us, uh, and particularly for women, uh, because this poverty is, um, uh, poverty feminization is a huge process in our country also. And uh, women, without even education and I'm sure they don't know this terminology like gender and gender equality, but they're trying to copy the strategies and to find the solutions for their livelihood um, and incorporate, generate more incomes for their families, for their children, and for uh, taking care for all this in, in this community. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Norira. Uh, Lillian's microphone and uh, microphone is also not working, but I really want to introduce uh, Lillian uh, because she, uh, we plan to have Lillian uh, in this panel. So let me just, you know, introduce because uh, Lillian also sent her introduction and she is also writing here. Let me introduce her and we can uh, at least, you know, applaud to her and her work, though we, are, we cannot, you know, uh, listen to her now because of uh, the technological hitch. Uh, so Lillian Debo Young is a polio survivor uh, for 24 years. She uses a wheelchair for her mobility. She was studying accounting at the University of Bua in Cameroon, but had to leave the study due to the Anglophone crisis in Cameroon. Lillian is a disability rights activist. She is awarded with best outstanding student and diploma holder in trauma counseling. She was also awarded with the best outstanding youth uh, with disability for impacting her community. Sitting on her wheelchair, she won the first runner up Miss Wheelchair in Cameroon. She currently works as CEO of Lillian Debo Foundation. Uh, and uh, because of this, you know, uh, technical error, Lillian, we cannot uh, hear you during this session, but you can certainly contribute to our discussion uh, forum uh, on our conference uh, website. Uh, sometimes, you know, technology gives us space to share and do conversation like this, but sometimes, you know, uh, it also creates some kind of hindrance. But we are so glad to at least see you, Lillian, here and to know more about you. Thank you uh, very much. And now I would like to wrap up um, this session uh, in which we talked about addressing the cultural norms to fight uh, against discrimination, inequality, and to uh, build the peace in our uh, own context. I would like to uh, thank, uh, I would like to you know, share my sincere gratitude to Nodira uh, Azizova from Uzbekistan and Gladys Farfan from uh, Bolivia and uh, Gloria Manzotti from Panama and Lillian Debo Young from uh, Cameroon. Thank you very much. You have brought so many issues uh, from your own experience uh, from claiming the masculine space uh, to creating the changes in the uh, policies uh, to uh, engaging the people considering the intersectionality uh, in your own uh, context and also creating that space for women to uh, exercise their agency and realize their uh, potential to address the cultural norms and to fight for uh, injustice. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all our amazing women leaders uh, who came as a panelist today. And, and many thanks to Jess, Pop, and, and Ruth uh, for supporting us uh, for the interpretation uh, today. Uh, we apologize if we went a bit you know, faster uh, because we are so passionate and we get so excited when we are sharing about our work. Apologies for that, but you did really wonderful uh, job. Thank you very much. And many thanks to all the attendees who were patient, patient, we had patient to listen to all of our panelists. And uh, so many thanks to Eileen Elma and Robin and all the uh, organizing committee members uh, to provide support to organize uh, this plenary session where we talked about and uh, did converse and learn from uh, each other. 
thank you very much have a uh, good day good evening good night namaste thank you thank you rahmat thank you gracias